Hi everyone, my name's Chris and welcome to Stony Creek Church Online. As we get ready to start the service, make sure to tap that like button, share the stream, and please post some comments. It's good for us to see who else is out there. In just a moment, we'll spend some time praising our great God. And following that, our senior pastor, Randy Ream, will begin a new series called Back to Life. Near the end, we're going to respond with some more praise and with praying over the offering. One of the best ways to communicate with the staff is through our online connection card. Visit my.stonycreek.church and click the connect button. Then simply fill out whatever information you like. This is a great way to communicate prayer requests or request further information on how to connect here at Stony. You can also give online at my.stonycreek.church anytime. And if you want to mail in a check, send that to Stony Creek Church at 45835 Van Dyke Avenue, Utica, Michigan, 48317. Giving is an act of worship as we respond to God with trust and thanksgiving. So even though we aren't meeting in person, this is a tangible expression of worship to our God. Last Sunday, we had a wonderful time together in the parking lot. This coming week, we want to give you the opportunity to gather again. It'll be on Wednesday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. This parking lot connection night will feature a few songs from our praise team and then a short but very inspirational message from Pastor Randy. There's going to be plenty of time to visit with each other after the service while still allowing space for physical distance and precautionary measures. I hope to see you there. We continue to value your prayers as the staff and elders have been working really hard to plan to gather once again. We believe God's led us to a great plan to begin to meet in person starting June 14th. This is with the expectations that things continue to trend in the same direction and that we're taking proper precautions. A detailed document has been published on our website, my.stonycreek.church, and it's going to go out in our email distribution list as well. Please feel free to contact me directly with any questions. This is gonna be an exciting time to gather once again together physically. Thank you for tuning in to Stony Creek Church Online today as we continue our mission to make more and better followers of Jesus together.
worshiping from, whether it's your living room or your kitchen, or maybe you're trying to find somewhere where the kids aren't grabbing at your, your shirt to get them breakfast or something. You know, just this is the place. This is your place that you set aside to worship the Lord. And you're asking, we're asking the Holy Spirit to fill whatever space you have right now where you're worshiping the Lord. And we're going to sing, lift up your hands and shout. And if there's any distraction, everyone around you is going to see. You're lifting your hands and you're praising the Lord. So let's sing, lift up your hands and shout. Lift up your hands and shout. The Lord is here right now. Lift up your voice and sing. He is holy. Lift up your hands and shout. The Lord is with us now. Lift up your voice and sing. He is holy. Lift up your hands and shout. The Lord is with us now. Lift up your voice and sing. He is holy. Lift up your hands and shout. The Lord is with us now. Lift up your voice and sing. He is holy.
Good morning and welcome to Stony Creek Church Online. So glad that you could join us for this morning's service and message. If you'd like to follow the outline this morning, just go to the Facebook post where you will see it. When will everything reopen? When can we get back to life? When will this quarantine be totally over? Opinions differ widely from those who believe things should not fully reopen until the virus has been all but cured, to those who think we should never have shut down in the first place. But the goal for every reasonable person is we've got to get back to life. Today, I'm beginning a new series called Back to Life. It's not about reopening our building, though we do plan to do that on June 14th, and you can follow our Facebook posts for more information on that. But what I'm talking about today is much more important than simply where or how we meet and get back to normal pre quarantine activity. I'm talking about bringing the church back to life. Yes, bringing our congregation back to life. Yes, bringing me back to life. And yes, if you need it too, bringing you back to life. The word we often use for this phenomenon is called revival. Revival. If you look it up on dictionary.com, it simply says restoration to life, consciousness, vigor, strength. Do you sense a deep longing for a fresh wind and a fresh fire to blow, to roar through your soul? Do you long to experience God in a deep, powerful, and meaningful way? Do you wish your heart would break for the things that break God's heart and leap for joy for the things that bring him joy, for the things that he loves? Do you wish you were less intimidated to share Jesus with unbelievers and more effective in leading people to Christ? I do. I plead guilty on all of the above. What I'm describing is the need for revival, the need for me to come back to life, and if you need it, for you to come back as well, and the need for our church to do so as a congregation. Can you say with me, Lord, I need revival? You say, but Randy, I'm already a Jesus follower. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's what it says, Randy, in 1 John 5, 12. I already have the Son. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he is the Lord, the God of my life. I've repented of my sins. I've embraced Jesus as my Savior. I already have eternal life. I'm not dead. And why would you say that you're dead? Why would you say that the congregation needs to be brought back to life? What in the world are you talking about, Randy? I'm glad you asked. That's what we're learning about today. I do need new life. I do have a deep longing for a fresh wind and fresh fire to roar through my soul. If you do too, look at our main idea. The one thing you should remember if you forget everything else that I say in this message, and if you're taking notes on your outline, it should be right there. It's this. Getting new life is a regular rather than a one-time event. That's what we're learning about today. It's a regular rather than a one-time event. Your soul, you might say, is like a flashlight battery. It wears down. Or like the gas tank in your car, it eventually runs out. 
We're going to look today at two realities for understanding our need for revival. You may think, Randy, I'm not sure I need revival. Well, we're going to look at that today. And you can find out, do I need it or do I not? The first reality for understanding our need for revival is, number one on the outline, Christians leak life. We leak. Picture yourself outside on a running track on an extremely hot, humid, sunny afternoon. You've just finished a long run and now you're really hot and thirsty. The perspiration is just pouring down your face. You're in danger of dehydration. Then you reach into your cooler and you pull out an ice-cold bottle of clear, fresh, clean water. You crack it open and you begin gratefully rehydrating yourself. You instantly feel reanimated, refreshed, and renewed. Isn't it great? You might say life is returning to you. With a little time to catch your breath and cool down under a nearby shady tree where you can finish your bottle of water and maybe even drink another one, you'll be as good as new. Your system has recovered the fluids that it lost. Well, the same thing happens with your soul. But when it comes to your soul, you see, everywhere you walk, after drinking that cool water, that spiritual water of life, a little trickle, you might say, runs down your leg, forming a tiny pool wherever you linger for more than a minute or so. Why so? How so? Because Christians leak life. You, you might say, are like a water bottle of Jesus' life that has tiny little holes in it. And the moment you get filled, you spring a leak. It starts coming out as soon as it comes in. It's spiritual dehydration. Do you feel it? You say, you mean to tell me, Randy, that I have to keep consuming eternal life to stay spiritually vibrant and alive and empowered and joyful? Precisely, exactly what I'm saying. Let me show you a verse in Scripture we're going to spend a moment or two looking at. John chapter 6, verse 35, the words of Jesus. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You say, Randy, that contradicts what you're teaching here today. He says, whoever believes will never be. You're saying we get thirsty. Jesus says you'll never be thirsty. Well, okay, but why then do we get thirsty? Hmm? Why do I feel a, a hunger and a thirst to get spiritually pumped up and strong? Why do I feel uh, strong one day, but feel all dried up and weary the next day? Why do I long for a fresh, flowing river of clear, cool water to refresh my soul if I'm never supposed to be thirsty ever? Answer, Christians leak. Christians leak life. Look again carefully at Jesus' words. He says, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Did you notice? The word believes here is in the present tense. He doesn't say whoever believed. He says whoever believes. Present tense. In the original Greek in which this was written, this is what New Testament scholars call a customary or a habitual use of the present tense. It's used to signal either an action that regularly occurs or an ongoing state. You say, now wait a minute, Randy, you're starting to lose me. Don't worry, please get this. It's very, very simple. Jesus is saying the person who continually believes, 
the person who keeps on believing, the person who doesn't just take one drink and then walks away and doesn't come back, but keeps coming for more, he or she is the person who will never be thirsty. Christians leak. Do you sense that feeling of spiritual drought? What are some things that might signal that? What's it like to be spiritually thirsty, feeling dried up? Well, for one, Bible reading for you will be boring, dry. Your mind wanders during worship. Prayer starts becoming mechanical. You run out of things to say after just a few minutes. You give in to temptation regularly. You, you feel defeated in your walk. And then lastly, on this list, evangelizing lost friends and relatives, well, it's not even your, on your radar. You hardly ever, maybe even never, really try. Still, you persist. You keep living the Christian life, but this is kind of the normal status quo. Does it sound familiar? It happens to all of us. Why? Christians leak. Christians leak life. You say, but Randy, a person either has eternal life or has not. Are you saying that a person who dries up spiritually, let's say he's all leaked out, he no longer has eternal life and that he's lost? Is that where you're going with this? No. What I want you to get is that eternal life, the word life in these passages is the Greek word zoe. Eternal life, it's not a thing you possess like a coin that's in your pocket and you zip it shut and you say, okay, it's mine and I've got it for good. No, eternal life is a person. More specifically, it's a personal relationship with God. Look carefully at a key verse. This is John chapter 17, verse 3. The words of Jesus. He says, this is eternal life. In other words, here is what eternal life equals. All right? Here it comes. To know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Eternal life is all about knowing God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. The Greek word that's translated know here is gnosko in Greek. It, it's a deep intimate knowledge, not a, a casual or merely factual knowledge. It's not simply like, well, I got the fact that two plus two equals four. No, this is a personal, experiential knowledge, like the way you know a very dear, close friend. There's more than simply facts involved. This is the essence of following Jesus a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, a relationship that consists of trust, love, and obedience to him. When that relationship is tight, there is a soul satisfaction, like cold water on a hot day, quenching a gnawing thirst. But like any very close relationship, it requires constant gulps, lots of sips, continually interacting with that person to, for that relationship to remain vibrant. That's what I'm talking about here. That's where I'm going here. Picture yourself again on that running track on that very hot, humid day. You're parched. You're exhausted. But instead of a full water bottle, all you can get is a tablespoon, maybe one swallow of that water. Now, yes, of course, that's better than nothing. You'll take it gladly, but it's not enough. My guess is 
that many of us are often surviving on just one gulp. And then we have to go on without being able to drink more. Someone asks you, how you doing? You say, I'm hanging in there. You're doing fine. You're okay. You're living the Christian life. You may not be in the middle of some disaster or catastrophe, but on the other hand, you're not thriving. You're not flourishing. You're not abounding with the joy and the power of the Lord. Why? Christians leak. We leak life. What is revival? Well, in the way we're talking about it here, on a personal level, it's when you get more than just a gulp or two. You drink all you need and more. It's refreshing. It's renewing. It is life-giving. You begin to devour Scripture, not just read it. Prayer flows from you. You begin to see that you have victory over temptation regularly. And evangelism, it begins to come naturally to you. Are you interested? Would you like that? Well, that's what we're talking about here today. Let's look at the second reality for understanding our need for revival. Number two on the outline, churches leak life. If you could put on for a moment spiritual spectacles, let's pretend that these are spiritual glasses. You put them on and you look around, what would you see? Well, one thing you would see are churches surrounded by pools of that living water, that eternal life, because like individual believers, churches also leak life. Unfortunately, though, many churches dry up. They haven't leaked in years. Why? Because they're bone dry. And, folks, it can happen not just to churches that deny the clear teachings of Scripture and don't preach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, by grace, uh, through uh, Him alone. It can also happen to biblical churches that appear bursting with life. In the book of Revelation, the risen Jesus speaks to just such a church. It's a church in the city of Sardis. Look what he says to this city in what today we would call Western Turkey. Back then it was called Asia Minor. This is the risen Jesus talking to a congregation in the city of Sardis. He says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. Ominous, frightful words, especially coming from Jesus himself to a church. Notice, this church is known for being alive. It has a reputation for liveliness, for vibrance. Today, we might picture it as uh, having a professional quality praise team, state-of-the-art lighting, the funnest children pro programs around, multiple campuses, and of course, a handsome, gifted pastor who draws crowds with mesmerizing messages and lively humor. He's got people rolling in the aisles. This is the church that all the other churches want to be like. This church puts on seminars for other churches to come out and learn how they can be like this church is. But Jesus says, you're dead. Wake up. Yikes. This is a church that has leaked out its life, and yet the congregation and the community give it rave reviews. If you go on Google, five-star reviews. 
They're packing out the place. What rattles me so much about the church at Sardis is that they're totally oblivious to their deadness. As they see it, they're not just fine. They're not just hanging in there. They're awesome. They're the best church in town. Folks, churches not only leak life, they can be dead and not even know it. Fear of this, this phenomenon, has jangled me for months. To the church at Sardis, Jesus says, I have found your deeds unfinished. In other words, they were doing the right things, but they weren't following those things through to completion. What things is he talking about? Well, he tells us, he says, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Past tense. In other words, it wasn't something new that they were lacking. It was stuff they already received and never fully applied. Yikes. Folks, that could be me. You know, I study the Word of God every day and enjoy it. I read the, the Greek New Testament. I've read it several times. I'm into it every day. I study Hebrew every day. And I love teaching it. I enjoy teaching the Word of God. But am I following through on it? If I'm dead, I want to know it. I don't want to just stay in the dark. I, I want to face it. I want to wake up. Do you? If you're in this condition? Well, let's look at 10 symptoms of needing revival. 10 symptoms. And ask yourself, as we go through these, these, by the way, are on your, your outline, posted on Facebook, so you can refer back to them. If you're just seeing them now and you're thinking, oh, I've got to write these down, look on that outline. See if you have any of these symptoms. The first, your praise or worship, like on Sunday morning, for example, it's not wholehearted. You're just going through the motions. It's not from the heart. It's kind of... Maybe I should get a cup of coffee. Yeah, I can do that, and I can go to the bathroom at the same time. It's, when is this going to be over kind of a thing? Just going through the motion. Second, your prayers are mechanical. You're just repeating the same things, and you run out of things to say quick. It's, it's not like you're talking to a real person. Next, your reading of the Word of God. It seems dry. Or maybe it's just irregular. It's, it's hit or miss whether or not you read. You can't remember when you read last and, and you can't remember what you read last. That kind of thing. It it's, ends up being boring often to you. Next, you never mourn over sin in society or in yourself. Yeah, maybe when an outrageous thing like the George Floyd incident happens that, that makes you angry and you say, man, what's going on? That's terrible. But normally, it's just not affecting you, the sin that's around us, the sin that's in us. Folks, this is a key sign of the need for revival is a lack of mourning over sin, no ache in the soul. Next, you feel no need for repentance turning away from sin. You haven't wept over your sin in, in years. When was the last time you really said, man, Lord, I'm, I just have to repent because I see the, the grievousness of my sin. Next, you view, you view church fellowship uh, or serving as non-essential. Yeah, if I have time for it, it's fine, but you know, today we got people coming over and I got to cut the lawn. That kind of thing. Next, you're not heartbroken over lost people. 
You care more about lost money than about lost neighbors nearby. Next, you don't evangelize the lost. It's just not on your radar. It's not something you think about. You say, hey, I live the life and I try to be a good person and all that, but that ache, that desire to see people come to know Christ. Next, the joy of the Lord is irregular or maybe totally missing in your life. You say, well, how do I know what that is? I'm, I'm a happy person. Well, the joy of the Lord means that it doesn't take circumstances to make you happy. And you're happy in Jesus, even uh, rain or shine kind of a thing. And then finally, acts of self-sacrifice are irregular. You're not on the lookout for helping the hurting. And you say, man, oh man, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff, Randy. Well, my intention here is not to judge anybody or, you know, condemn anyone. I'm working on these things myself, and yet I have the joy of the Lord, all right? So uh, I know I have a long way to go, but I rejoice in the fact that God still has more for me. And that's the way we need to look at these things. I consider myself in need of revival. And I ask you to please pray for me. If you're revived, fine. Pray for Randy Rehm. If you have any of these symptoms, then you're in need of revival. A long, cool, cold, Holy Spirit drink. Now what's the solution? Well, let's go back to what Jesus said to the Sardis church. He said, hold it fast and repent. The it, remember, is what you have received. Hold it fast and repent. Two things. Number one, get back to basics. This is the stuff we all know. And two, repent. Turn. Do an about face away from what displeases God back to him, back to those things in that symptom list. If you were here and we were all meeting together this morning in this building, I would ask you to come forward in front of this stage, in front of this platform, where we, you could signal your need, your desire for uh, revival and for God to move mightily in you where we could kneel together and pray for God to pour out his spirit afresh on us. And we can't do that here together as a congregation, but it might, it just might be even more effective if we view today as a time to reflect on these symptoms. I would encourage you and challenge you to look over those things and pray over those things that we went over and daily to do that for revival in us and at Stony Creek Church. I hope you're on the 9-11 prayer team setting your, uh, your uh, phone for, for 9-11. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Rather than seeking a one-time emotional experience, let's ask God for a long-term renewal and revival. You know, God has brought many revivals throughout history from the days of the apostles to our own days. A revival is not something that humans can schedule. It is a God thing. It's not just a time for Christians to get emotional and act weird or to only expect supernatural manifestations. Often that's what we think of with revival. And those things usually do happen when God genuinely brings revival. We do see people acting weird. We do see people getting very emotional. We do see supernatural manifestations. But those things are at best the sparks that fly out of the flame, or at worst, they're just excesses of people who are just looking for attention. If you're interested in learning more about revival, let me encourage you to check out a book called The Ten Greatest Revivals Ever by Elmer Towns and Douglas Porter. And this is an easy read and it's a very inspiring book. I dare you to read it. 
because when you do, sparks will fly. So that's the uh, warning. But let me close today by telling you briefly about the revival that transformed my life. If it hadn't been for this revival I'm going to tell you about, I wouldn't be a Jesus follower and Stony Creek Church wouldn't exist. Perhaps you've heard of it, the Jesus movement. I, I talk about it every once in a while. It happened in the 1960s into the 1980s. It was a powerful revival that swept our country and affected the world. But it started in some unlikely places, like on the beaches of Southern California by leaders uh, like a humble pastor by the name of Chuck Smith and his wife. Uh, in 1965, the California beaches were filled with young people who had rebelled against their parents. They ran away from home and they rebelled against the political system. They began living together in communes and using drugs and alcohol and, and engaging in lots of uh, free sex and looking into Eastern religions. Well, Pastor Chuck and his wife were deeply burdened to reach these young people. And so they began praying and evangelizing them and discipling them one by one. Before long, whole communities of Jesus' people who had been radically converted to Jesus had given up their old ways and these people began to just spring up all over the place, whole communities of them. They were so open about sharing Jesus that they couldn't help but stand out. People began to call them Jesus freaks. Maybe you've heard that expression before. The name stuck. Uh, it probably started as a put down at first, but the Jesus people, as they were sometimes called, they accepted it with pride. Pastor Smith's uh, church building couldn't hold the crowds of young people getting radically saved, and so he rented out a bigger facility. When they quickly outgrew that, there were people standing outside and couldn't get in. They had to move into a big tent. And then they moved into a shopping center. And then they built an auditorium that would seat thousands and thousands of people with a regular Sunday attendance of 10,000. People still had to sit outside. There were so many. They held baptisms in the Pacific Ocean with thousands of spectators. Eventually, Pastor Chuck's church planted over 600 churches. Many of them became huge congregations pastored by Jesus freak pastors, pa hippie pastors. The movement spread like wildfire uh, to Washington State, Wisconsin, Illinois and Chicago, it was huge. Florida and Michigan, of course. And as a result, thousands of new churches and Christian coffee houses were started all over the United States and eventually the world. It was a phenomenon the world could not ignore. Addicts whom every institution had tried to fix and failed were getting radically transformed. Time magazine dubbed it the Jesus Revolution, and it was a revolution. And it was no flash in the pan fad, folks. It began, as I said, in the 60s and lasted well into the 80s. If you like guitars and drums and non-traditional music in church, well, thank the Jesus movement for it. That's where it started. If you like Christian music beyond just singing hymns, thank the Jesus movement for it. One of those dear Jesus freaks was Frank Majeski. Thank God for Frank Majeski, a man who had been radically converted from a life of violence and uh, heavy drug use to become a fearless preacher. This man, oh, it was, it was just phenomenal. 
uh, huge crowds. He could hold spellbound in jails and in public parks. Public high schools would uh, beg Frank to come and to speak to classrooms and auditoriums packed with students. And they, they got saved in droves. Frank started meeting on Friday nights, a couple of blocks from where I grew up, where I lived. Hundreds of young people came from all over the Detroit area and Canada every Friday night, rain or shine. We would meet for three to four hours, sometimes longer. We'd be out in the parking lot. The custodian couldn't get rid of us after he turned off the lights. We were singing praises to Jesus, and most of us were sitting on the floor, for crying out loud. There weren't enough chairs. Listening to Frank preach, that's where Randy Ream became a Jesus follower and got baptized a few months later. I began witnessing to my friends and led many of them to Jesus and discipled many. I've seen God move in many mighty ways throughout the years. But folks, I have never experienced anything like that since. And I carry to this day a yearning, a burning desire to see that happen again. It's a God thing. Only he can do it. We can't manufacture it we don't talk him into it, no. But we can and should prepare ourselves. Do you long for a fresh wind and a fresh fire to roar through your soul? Well then, getting new life is a regular rather than a one-time event. Are you thirsty? Do you long for that fresh wind and fresh fire in your soul? Well, then join me. Set your phone alarm to 9-11 a.m. or p.m. I've got mine set at a.m. as you can see. But you can set yours at p.m. if that's a better time for you to remind you to pray right then and there for revival, even if you can only do so for a moment. Let's unite together at these times of the day. Begin praying for yourself regarding the symptoms that I listed earlier. Pray for me on these things and the other Stony Creek Church leaders and the whole Stony Creek congregation. And please let me know. Let me know if this is happening in your life. We're going to close our service in just a few moments, we're going to transition to our offering time. Many of you have already given online or perhaps mailed in your offering, and that's wonderful. Uh, we're not going to give right now, but we're going to dedicate our gifts right now so that this is more than simply writing a check or uh, clicking send or whatever. This is an act of worship the Lord. So let's do that right now with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus who gives us life. And it isn't just something that we have, it's, it's him who we have. May that relationship, Lord, may that relationship be tight, may it be close, May it be filled with life and where we are lacking, Lord, bring us back to life. Bring us back to life today. Lord, as we give you of our tithes and offerings, we ask that it would be from the heart. It would not just be a, a duty we perform, but an act, an act of worship that we dedicate to you. We do so in the name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus, who died for us and rose from the dead. Amen. I have my alarm set for 9-11 every morning, and Randy has called each of us to do that at 9-11 in the morning or 9-11 at night, and he's asked us to stop and pray at 9-11 and just ask the Lord to revive the church. 
And who is the church? It's us. It's me. And I love what Randy said, you know, weeks ago, maybe more than once in the prayer letter, that revival starts in me. I have to ask God to purify me again. Not just the first time I got saved and I gave my life to Christ. We're redeemed, but daily, revive me. And I don't know what you're praying for at 9-11 specifically, because I think revival looks a little different for each person in this church. And that's my prayer every morning at 9-11. I pray that God would just wreck my heart, purify me, search my heart. If there's any offensive way to you, God, would you point it out? Give me the courage not to ignore it. Give me the courage to repent. Give me the courage to surrender to you. And this song is all about surrender and seeking the Lord and allowing him in to your heart. And I encourage you to pray with me every day at 9-11 that God would just create a move, that our hearts would be ready for what he wants to do in each one of us, that revival would start with each one of us. Whatever that looks like for you, ask the Lord. Together with one voice, one. 
As we close off this morning, I want to thank you for participating online. If you'd like to respond to today's message, or if you have any prayer requests, the best way to communicate those needs would be through our online connection card. It's found at my.stonycreek.church. We'd love to be praying for you and with you through the week. Keep looking for ways to connect online, guys. And until then, God bless.